Hello, everybody. I'm Alex Capri. I'm a senior fellow in the NUS Business School and a lecturer. Um, today, I'm going to be speaking with you and uh, hopefully fielding some of your questions about global value chains today and how those global value chains have been impacted by recent events, uh, most notably COVID-19. Um, and this is a very, very important discussion to be having right now because there are a number of things that have been in play in global value chains. Um, but first, before I do that, let me just tell you a little bit more about myself. Um, speaking of global value chains, I've spent about the last 20 years uh, working on cross-border trade and commerce, uh, focusing on everything from the, the customs and trade and the indirect tax side to the flow of information, uh, to the optimization of free trade agreements, uh, as well as to other strategic uh, angles on uh, manufacturing and supply chain. Uh, so I've been keeping my eye on this, uh, this situation for quite a long time, obviously. And I can tell you without any hesitation that the period of time right now, the period in history that we're in is an absolute watershed. Um, we are seeing um, the, the culmination uh, of a number of different dynamics uh, that are all converging, and I'll get into that in a minute, and now those are being accelerated by, uh, by this COVID-19. But before, before I get there, um, let, me just, let me just put this out there. Uh, as, a, as a rhetorical question or just as a question um, not to be answered, but um, what exactly is a global value chain? Um, a global value chain is essentially a series of inputs of materials, uh, of information, of human capital, of services that result in a particular output. So it could be a finished product, it could be a subcomponent, um, it could be a service. Um, but all of this is, is sort of the cumulative effect of all these inputs, which then produce a new pair of shoes, a semiconductor, a computer. Um, and going back 30 years, uh, we, you know, at the beginning of this, this great expansion of globalization that we saw really going, starting in the 1980s, um, where we began to see a massive amount of offshoring, meaning um, the rationalization of supply chains where you would unbundle activities to the most uh, desirable location where you would get the best uh, return on your investment, labor, overhead costs, access to capital and clusters and supplier networks, etc. So we saw this push starting in the 1980s of this great offshoring phenomenon, um, which really continued uh, at full speed until the early 2000s. Um, a major event happened in the early 2000s, 2001, when China joined the World Trade Organization. Uh, and from that point, we saw uh, for, for about another 10 or 15 years, we saw an acceleration of global value chains going to China. Um, but what's happened in the last seven, eight years is we've seen three very, very critical fundamental dynamics emerging. Um, one is that we've seen um, technology and automation, uh, which has been introduced uh, into global value chains, which is, which is pushing more of a regionalization or even a localization of production. Um, so if you can fully automate a factory um, and you can produce as close as possible to your market, uh, then why have a fully extended global value chain if you can, if you can build an ecosystem much closer uh, to your market? So, so technology and automation has been localizing and regionalizing. And so we've seen a fracturing of global value chains just from that perspective. The second um, very powerful force, which has really kicked in, of course, is geopolitics. So geopolitics, uh, and by that I mean the U.S.-China systemic rivalry, which has produced, for example, um, these tariff wars, um, which really are a subset of that much bigger geopolitical rivalry. 
Um, and now, of course, we see the rise of techno nationalism and the decoupling of value chains in strategic specific sectors. Um, so we're seeing uh, an increase in non tariff measures that are targeting the technology sector, such as semiconductors, 5G, uh, and so on, which um, are very disruptive to 30 plus years of global value chain formulation to China and into China. Um, so we have localization, we have geopolitics, and we have automation. All of these have been systemically, uh, or systematically rather, fracturing and uh, regionalizing and localizing global value chains. Um, now, we also have, uh, we have uh, sort of a difference emerging and also a fracturing of, of ideological values, which are now increasingly baked into things like free trade agreements and in good governance frameworks and standards. And those are standards around things like um, privacy, uh, uh, you know, uh, censorship, uh, environmental standards, transparency standards, uh, et cetera. So, so those are very, very, um, uh, I should say, regionalized uh, types of values. Um, uh, now I see a question has just come in uh, and the question is, will localization of value chains enable a circular economy to take place more easily? That's an excellent question. Circular economy, of course, is an environmentally conscious, sustainable kind of economy where from the design phase all the way through to the production phase, everything is designed to be reused, reincorporated uh, and recycled. And the answer to that question is yes, absolutely. Um, uh, and I'll come to that. I'll come to what this new global environment means to things like environmental uh, sustainability. But let me get back to um, where I was. So, so we have these, these overriding forces, which I just mentioned again, geopolitics, automation, localization, of course, nationalization or, or nationalism. And now we have COVID-19. So COVID-19 comes along and um, what do we have? We, the world wakes up to this reality that value chains, global value chains have become very, very clustered and embedded in China. So for example, if you look at um, the first uh, sort of threat of a pandemic, which was in 2003, which was um, SARS, um, China's um, global GDP, its contribution to global GDP was about 4%. Now, if you fast forward now to 2019, uh, you're looking at about 19% of global GDP. So in that period, we saw this acceleration of investment into China by foreign uh, multinationals. Uh, and that included uh, investment in production, investment in R&D, investment in, in, in ecosystems. Um, and of course, we saw that the automotive industry became highly exposed uh, when Wuhan was shut down. Uh, you know, the, for example, the, the major three Japanese automakers had to shut down production facilities in Japan because they couldn't get access to parts uh, made in, in China. Uh, we saw uh, an exposure in the pharmaceutical industry where it you know, turns out that you know, for prescription drugs, 90% of the ingredients for prescription drugs are made in China uh, or India uh, and you know, antibiotics, et cetera, same story. So what does all that mean? It means that there's, uh, if you combine that with the fact that um, you know, for the last two plus years, we've had decoupling from Chinese uh, value chains happening on account of the trade war, where companies were uh, moving supply chains out of China and relocating them to places like Vietnam, Mexico, um, other parts of the world. Um, that was already happening. So now we, we have this whole COVID-19 event. We have this, this, this realization that we've got this, this hyper-dependency on China for value chains. So all of those things that I've just mentioned are going to accelerate. Uh, let's see, we've got another question here. Let me, let me see if I can take that. 
do you see protectionism, self-sufficiency on the rise uh, given the COVID-19? Um, other than the US, which country do you think will engage in more uh, protectionism? Well, um, this is another great question. Um, if you look at um, things like uh, uh, ventilators, uh, face masks, uh, critical drugs and pharmaceuticals, um, many countries have imposed export controls on those types of goods. In other words, uh, preventing them from leaving their country. Um, within the EU, uh, you certainly have you know, the United States, certainly China has done it and other countries. So um, that I think is an indication that we're seeing more and more a return to, um, to again, uh, nationalistic domestic priorities. Um, and so the, the, the answer to the question is yes, I do think that, um, that we're going to see increased protectionism. Um, and I'm almost out of time. So I think I've, I've hit on all the high points. Um, I, I do think that, um, that there's silver lining. So let me close on a positive note. Uh, I think there's some real silver lining um, in this whole uh, uh, you know, COVID-19, post-COVID-19, post-pandemic world, where I think there's an opportunity now for, um, you know, when you have this massive change taking place, governments uh, essentially bailing out industries, possibly taking ownership in, you know, holding shares in some types of companies, I think this discussion around uh, global value chains and carbon footprints and uh, you know, reduction in, in carbon emissions and global value chains uh, is, going to, uh, is going to lead to a, a real revolution, I think, in green tech, green technology. Um, I think you know, there's gonna be allocation of capital in those areas. We'll see the, uh, we'll see the rise of public-private partnerships between corporations and governments and NGOs working to solve this problem. Um, I think we'll see, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see, um, certainly there'll be revolutions in new technologies around communications uh, and, and so forth. So um, there, and, and of course, restructuring and reshoring of, of supply chains to react to all those things that I've mentioned, uh, which means that there's huge capacity building uh, that's going to have to take place. So that's massive for uh, logistics companies, professional services firms, architectural firms, banks, uh, and so on and so forth, and startups and technology firms. So I think there's, there's big change coming, but there's also big opportunity within that change. Okay, let me see if I can take a question here. Uh, let's see. All right, here's another question. Uh, the geopolitics regarding China may change the way we do business with this factory of the world. Uh, how will the current developing countries like Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, and India cover the gaps? Well, we're already seeing that um, we're seeing uh, production facilities moving out of China to places like Vietnam and these other countries that you just mentioned. Um, so I, I expect to see more of that. Within reason, uh, you know there there are other challenges to moving businesses uh, to uh, emerging markets like that. China will remain a very important market. So what I see happening is companies will have to come up with an in China for China value chain that will service the Chinese market uh, because it's such a big important market. Assuming that they're not decoupled by law. Uh, through export controls or restrictions, uh, and then there are those, there are specific industries that are just going to have to decouple. Um, but then, in addition to an in China for China sort of production uh, strategy, you know, play in that sandbox alone, there will be redundancies in terms of having to build those same kind of uh, value chain ecosystems in other parts of the world. So you know the you know, we're going to see that uh, where, you know, we have a pharmaceutical company that is going to have to be producing certain kinds of drugs within North America. Uh, doesn't mean they can't produce them in China, but they're going to have to be able to produce them within North America. And they may have to have a similar requirement um, for, uh, for the European Union, et cetera. Um, 
All right, another question. Uh, China has a stranglehold over many source materials vital to production like antibiotics, rare earth metals, magnets, and others. Will China resort to its controls on these uh, materials to mitigate any exodus from China? Another great question. Um, well, look, the answer to that is um, if they were to do that, the collateral damage would be so significant, uh, not just to the, the target companies that are relying on those rare earth materials, for example, like Apple and other electronics makers, but what about the whole value chain that's in China, right? We've just talked about that. It's huge, right? It's, it's, there's a lot of assembly going on. Um, so the, the answer is yes, they, it's, it's, a, it's a card that they could play, uh, but it would, it would be hugely destructive uh, you know, to Chinese companies as well. You can make that same argument about semiconductors. The United States has an absolutely dominant position when it comes to semiconductors. In fact, uh, China, which is the world's largest market, has the highest demand for semiconductors, can only produce 5% of their demand. And, th and, and those Chinese companies are one, two, three generations behind. That's maybe 10 years behind Western technology. So you could make the same argument and say, well, what if the West or the United States in particular were to absolutely, uh, you know, which has a chokehold on that technology, cut that off? That would of course bring the Chinese economy to its knees, but look what it would do to the global economy and look at the collateral damage to all these American companies. So although we do have these, these situations, um, it would be, not really in everybody's interest to try and pull that trigger. Another question, do you see an acceleration in the employment of AI because of COVID-19? And if so, what is the implication to the global supply chain? Absolutely, uh, there's going to be a huge uh, acceleration in uh, the application development and execution of new AIs to fully automate supply chains, um, to automate factories, uh, and we've already, we're, we're seeing that. So for example, uh, the Japanese company Canon um, has been building fully automated factories to make cameras. And the reason they've done that is because they want to reshore those factories out of China and other countries and bring them back to Japan, which they're doing, although they are fully automated. In fact, speaking of Japan, Japan has now launched a new program um, which it's about $2.2 billion worth of money that they're paying Japanese companies to move their production out of China. Okay, so this speaks to the other trends that, that I was mentioning earlier. All right, um, next question. Uh, do you see the trade war intentions between the US and China continuing in the long term? Yes, absolutely. Uh, or are there politicians just going to play the blame game till everybody recovers from COVID? Well, look, um, they're playing the blame game already. Uh, and, you know, this is a time when, when there should be international cooperation during an inter a major international crisis like this. We're not seeing the kind of cooperation that we saw in the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009, for sure. Uh, and, um, you know, I think if anything, COVID-19 has really laid bare the, the extent of the US-China, and I think even more um, importantly, the extent of the, of the China versus the West um, systemic differences, which again, is our, uh, we will see this in terms of acceleration of these, these geopolitical impacts on, um, on global supply chains. Next question. Uh, what advice would you give the, uh, to the Singapore government with foreseeable tighter trade regulations? Uh, which industries do you think Singapore should enter to be less exposed to such trade dynamics? Another outstanding question. Um, so Singapore um, has made its bread and butter and living as a uh, trading node, right? As an entrepot, um, you know, it, 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 ha it relies extreme, I mean, it totally relies on uh, and so when we see this, this drop off in the global economy, uh, we see this 30% drop off in global trade, according to the WTO, potentially this year compared to last year, how does Singapore come out of this? Um, 
I think Singapore, um, you know, obviously it's going to feel pain in terms of trying to get its local economy going and, and you know, getting, getting people in small businesses and so forth, um, you know, getting the shops open like everywhere else. But I think Singapore um, in the long term is still in pretty good shape. I've always been very bullish on Singapore in terms of the fact that it's, uh, it's an innovation center. Um, it's, it's got free trade agreements. It's got almost, I think it's got about 26, 27 free trade agreements, almost more than any other country. It's connected to the world. Um, it's got good governance. It's got great infrastructure. You know, it's got, you know, good leadership. So I think, I think in terms of dealing with this, this shock from COVID-19, um, Singapore is going to focus more and more on the, uh, on the, the digital economy, uh, even its capacity building um, around the region, which is a huge opportunity for Singapore because we have all these supply chains moving out of China, moving into these other countries in Southeast Asia, which means that Singapore has a lot of knowledge, human capital, and capacity building expertise to be able to profit from that. And I do see that happening. Um, next question. Um, how will semiconductor manufacturing be impacted by the COVID-19? Given that it is a cyclical industry, uh, will it continue to face downward pressure for the coming years and how will it recover? Um, I think it's interesting to note that even when everything else was shut down and locked down in Wuhan, in China, there were there was just one exception to what companies would stay open no matter what, and what production facilities would stay open no matter what, and those were semiconductors. Uh, so you had a, you know, you had, you know, Yangtze Memory Semiconductor and, 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 and others in Wuhan that were still producing on orders by the Chinese government. So semiconductors are, in my opinion, um, the, you know, apart from energy, um, they are, to me, the most, and, and of course, agriculture, they are the most crucial industry because they are at the heart and soul of every single technology that we're using today, all of the industries of the future. Um, if you look at China, for example, you know, China spends more importing semiconductor technology than it does importing oil. All right. So that industry is, is, uh, is going to be kept alive one way or another by governments uh, if they have to, uh, if they have to keep it alive, all right? Um, let's see another question here. Uh, there's a question here on what impact do you think this disruption would likely have overall in China's government uh, Belt and Road Initiative and its trading partners? Well, the Belt and Road Initiative, like every other uh, form of activity in the world, is going to take a major hit because the global economy is in a self-induced coma right now. Uh, demand has fallen off the cliff because everything is shut down in many countries. Um, even though you know China's economy is probably back 85 percent, its its factories are only at about 60 percent because of global demand. Uh, so. The Belt and Road Initiative will be no different, but I do think the Belt and Road Initiative will continue to come under increased scrutiny from the West uh, as a geopolitical um, issue, uh, and I think it will continue to be problematic um, for China in terms of uh, being able to to garner uh, international support. You know, other than Chinese companies. Uh, and you know the Chinese government's uh, objectives around BRI, I think it's going to be because of all of this fragmentation that I've been talking about. I think it's going to be increasingly challenging for Beijing to uh, enlist uh, foreign uh, support for the Belt and Road Initiative. Not to mention pay for it. Um, you know, given given all these other issues going on. Uh, okay, how are we doing for time? Um, Let's see. Okay, here's another question. Um, this is kind of a long one. There's a, a little bit of a preamble in front of it. It's been said that we will be seeing lockdown and reopen taking place over the next 24 months. What's your view on this? Uh, the implication is certainly international logistics. And also we've seen implication of the last mile delivery. Yes, okay. Um, that's another great question. Um, so what's different about this particular um, economic uh, 
shock, if you will, is that we're seeing impacts on both the supply and the demand side. Um, and so we're, you know, because of, for example, supply, we're seeing a couple of things. One is that companies are closed, employees are at home, they're in lockdown, so they're not producing. Uh, but another is that you have traditional supply chains in agriculture, for example, that have been producing for different market segments. So for example, take uh, the dairy uh, um, industry, they make cheese, they make milk. Um, you know, in an open economy that's, that's, that's not in lockdown, a lot of that milk and cheese and product goes to big institutions, right? It goes to uh, hotels, it goes to schools, it goes to restaurants. So it's packaged in sort of large, larger sizes. Now you have people that are all going home. They still need milk. They still need cheese. They still need beer. Um, but uh, or they at least they still want beer. They may not need it. Uh, but you know at least you know now now if those um, those those production sides have been used to producing ten gallon uh, kegs of beer and ten pound chunks of cheese. They're not going to be able to sell that because the individual consumer doesn't need that much, and they don't, and so they can't package it right. So that all that goes to waste. So that's a, that's a problem. Uh, last mile delivery um, is also in a position where um, you have these crazy spikes in demand from one day to the next, as you know people decide that they need more toilet paper, or they need a, a laptop computer, or they need something else, and so it becomes challenging. Um, not only to produce those in these large spikes, particularly when you have, uh, you know, containerization uh, is way, way down. Yeah, there's not a lot of containers that are in circulation right now. Air freight is down. You know, you've got most uh, international carriers that are, uh, you know, they've reduced 80, 90 percent of their capacity. And so costs have gone way up on that limited capacity. And again, supply and demand is just up and down and up and down. So it's, it's going to be really tricky. You know, will this last for the next 24 months? Um, it could. It could. I mean, I think we're going to see sort of this rolling sort of phase in and phase out. We'll probably see a second wave of infections, maybe even a third wave. I mean, historically, if you look uh, if you go back to 1919, the Spanish flu, there were three waves of that, uh, um, second being the biggest. So yeah, this is something that's going to be with us a while. Um, life is going to go back to normal for quite some time. Okay. Uh, all right, let's wrap things up now. Uh, please watch out for uh, visiting Professor Sherry uh, Kimes on Wednesday. Uh, she'll be talking about the hospitality industry and whether it will survive uh, COVID-19. So that should be a good one. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining. And I know we'll be putting this out um, on the web, so you should be able to watch a recording of this. Thanks a lot.